Welcome, everybody. It's 7 p.m. or just a little after. Uh, welcome to the KPMS uh, September membership and public meeting. Um, we're doing it a little different this uh, this month um, because we have so many people in because we have such a fantastic speaker. So uh, it's really just going to be the the presentation and look for a, a special newsletter update coming out in the next uh, week or so that we'll talk about what we're going to do um, for the remainder of the month, um, any foray activity that's going on and uh, plans for um, the upcoming month's presentations, as well as um, newly hatched plans for uh, a COVID friendly annual mushroom show uh, comprised of lots of uh, smaller socially distanced forays and activities. So uh, lots of stuff coming up. But for tonight, um, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our vice president, um, Kirsten, to introduce our featured speaker. All right. Yeah, my name is Kirsten Johnston. And I'm you know, the vice president of our Kids at Peninsula Mycological Society. And I would love to welcome everybody, lots more people than usual, to our Kids at Peninsula, which is, by the way, the ancestral home of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Suquamish tribe, and now currently home to a diverse multicultural community. And in our club meetings, we had um, in past times many famous or influential speakers, but the tonight's speaker is all together on a total different level. And that's why we decided we want to share this uh, beyond our club uh, members to other um, clubs and friends. And we broadcasted this out to uh, a myriad ways um, I put it out to my bee friends, to my master gardener friends, to tree friends, to the community, to my German friends, and whoever I could think of. Because I really think that Suzanne's um, message is important and we should bring it out to lots of people. So I like to welcome Suzanne. Suzanne so Zimmert is professor of the uh, forest ecology uh, of the University of British Columbia. And she is the leader of the Mother Tree Project. Uh, she is a pioneer in the field of plant community and intelligence. And her latest or her latest book, Finding the Mother Tree, came out in May this year. And it's already on lots of bestseller lists and um, many of our club members have bought it and read it and read it. And we as a club, we donated uh, 10 books to our local public library because we heard that they have a waiting list of like 50 people for the books <laughs> they had. <laughs> and so... We also had this really great idea, or one of our members, Susan, had this idea to also put it into school libraries. So mm -hmm. we haven't done this yet, but we will. And um, so the plan for this evening, as John already said, we, hear, we will hear first a 20-minute talk from Susan. Then I will start with a couple of questions. And in the meantime, every one of you listeners should um, write their questions as they pop up into the chat and then we will try to get to as many as possible in the end all right so there we go susan i can't wait i'm super <laughs> excited thank you kirsten and thank you john for inviting me and thank you everybody for being here um it's my pleasure to be here especially talking to mike micophiles um i don't get to do that very often and 
So I just want to start um, by saying just to, to follow on and acknowledge that I am on the unceded territory of three nations, the First Nations of Aboriginal people here in Canada, um, the Sinaiics, which overlaps with the American border. And recently, we, we, that this nation has been reinstated as, a, as a, a bona fide nation in Canada. They were declared extinct, actually. Um, uh, about, I don't know, 50 years ago. Um, and we've just recognized them again as an, as a, as a, a nation in Canada. And they actually live, you know, right through the territory. I'm in the Kootenai region. Um, I'm also, it's overlapping with the territory of the Tanaha nation, um, as well as the Okanagan nation. And, and I just also wanted to acknowledge that uh, my work has actually been in collaboration with many First Nations in British Columbia, and um, and that's going to be infused through my talk today. Um, I also just wanted to say that, you know, I got my, my master's and PhD at Oregon State University, so not that far from where you guys are. And, um, and, and of course, you have, you know, such a, a brain wealth in the United States about fungi and forests. And I've learned so much from, from my uh, American colleagues and friends. Um, and so I, I, I have to say that, you know, a lot of this work was in collaboration with my American friends and mentors and, and, and teachers at, at Oregon State. I also just wanted to say, too, that I'm a forester. <laughs> um, I, I was trained as a forester. I wasn't trained as a mycologist. But of course, you know, I think anybody who wants to understand ecosystems needs to look at fungi. And so I come from it from a forest point of view. And of course, you'll see that in my lecture. Um, and as you ask questions, you can, of course, ask me more detailed questions about the fungi because my, my lecture is more about the ecosystem. So here we go. Um, the book that I wrote is really, um, it's, a, it's a journey, right? It's a memoir. It's a memoir that takes the science that I've done over the last 40 years, that I've published in many journal articles, um, and brings it to the public sphere. And I wanted to do this because I found that, you know, people who are actually having big influences on forests, where mushrooms grow, um, policymakers, practitioners, really didn't know about it or didn't understand it or ignored this work. And, um, and I thought, you know, we really need the public to understand this, to push our governments to make changes so that we protect our environments more carefully. And I've included here a spiral because this, this is a spiral for a, a journey of my own from when I was a child where I grew up in forests to where I am now understanding the importance of connection of these relationships in forests for the whole global community and for our global biogeochemical cycles and society as a whole. So yes, Kirsten, I totally agree with you. This has got to be, uh, in, I think, information brought to everybody's understanding. Um, so I'm going to start with this map. Um, you'll recognize this is British Columbia, just north of, of where you are. This is a map that actually shows the First Nations, um, the language groups of, of our First Nations in British Columbia. There's actually 200 nations that have been recognized. So this is just a, a simplified version of it. I live down here in the uh, in this area right here in the Tanaha, the Okanagan, and the Sinaiics is this group that comes up and they actually uh, overlap with these two nations. Um, but my work includes work in, in the Shepomek, um, the Sekene, the D Dakel, the Wet'suwet'en, the, S the Sokotan, um, all the way with the Coast Salish, the Nechanlith, the Kwakwakawa, the Haltzik, the Simshan, the Haida nations. I work with all of these nations. Um, and so their work, their understanding uh, is brought to bear on this. And, and I guess, you know, one thing I wanted to acknowledge too is that um, there is a, there was a, a Coast Salish man, uh, Bruce Miller, or uh, Subie, who lived in, in, in Seattle, and he actually understood these connections that I'm going to talk about, these mycorrhizal networks, these mycelial networks that underlay the forest. This knowledge has been around for thousands of years, and it's really just, you know, uh, bringing Western science to uncover for the rest of us what has been known for a long, long time. So I just wanted to start with that. So this is where I grew up. I grew up in these forests. These are iconic inland rainforests. Um, this is Western red cedar. The forests um, 
are mixed forests. They've got hemlock, they've got birch and aspen and larch and western white pine, lodgepole pine, um, at the high elevations, white bark pine. These are really important, iconic forests. They're very productive forests. So I grew up here. This is what I knew as whole ecosystems, as a kid playing in these environments and um, playing with my brother and sister and getting to know these at a very visceral level. And my family uh, um, actually were, were loggers in these forests. They were horse loggers. And they lived along what's called the Shushwak River. And this is a, a salmon river. And sam I, I'm bringing this up because salmon influenced these forests all through the Pacific Northwest in a very deep way. Um, the, the collapse of the salmon populations is tightly linked with how healthy our forests are and of course how healthy all of the creatures in the forest include the mycelium and the mycorrhiza they're all interlinked together and I'm going to come back to the importance of salmon and caring for salmon and forests later in my introduction into my in my presentation so one of the things as a forester that you face is that even though I grew up in a province of old growth forest, it's turned into a province of clear cuts. This is devastating. It's devastating for me as a person. It's devastating for us as a people, for our First Nations people. Um, it's devastating for, for our, you know, for, for global change. Um, this all contributes, it's all link, interlinked with it. And I study this. I understand the impact of this on our carbon cycle. I've studied the impact of this on our biodiversity below ground and above ground. The impacts are broad, they're extensive, they're, and they're long term. Um, and so it's this framework as a forester that I brought, I came in to study fungi and the importance of fungi and networks in forests. And I, as a young forester, I was dealing with the conversion of our old growth forests, which is all part of the plan, right, of, of colonization, came along with it, the plan to liquidate the old growth forests and turn them into second growth forests. Um, so this is, these are planted forests that are cultivated, they're, they're uh, planted with, you know, often they're monocultures, and they get weeded out of diversity, really, the, the broadleaf trees, the trees and plants that are not are considered competitors with these trees. And the consequences of this are severe. Um, I think that we didn't understand when we started doing this back in the 60s and 70s and 80s what the consequences would be. We didn't understand all the unexpected effects, but some of them are this. So, you know, this is a plantation of lodgepole pine in the suborial forest to the north of where I live. Um, this has happened in many places where we convert these diverse forests into simple plantations. They get infested with beetles. They get infested with all kinds of insects. They get infested with um, pathogens. They're not very healthy. And I've, I've studied this across British Columbia. We found that, you know, plantations that we thought were okay, you know, five years after they're declared okay, we go back and we find that there are 50 damaging, 50 5 damaging agents in these forests that have reduced density down by 50%. Um, these are not healthy forests to be in. They're not healthy forests for the future. And so I wanted to understand, you know, what were we doing? Like we're basically dissecting our diverse forests and turning them into monocultures. And, um, and there are, and Essentially, what we're simplifying is not just the forest. We're simplifying the whole ecosystem below ground. And so when I went back to do my PhD, after learning about, you know, forest practices, how we're simplifying forests, and I studied that, and I figured out that, you know, these pine plantations weren't doing well. Why is it? What is it that we're doing wrong? And so I turned to the below ground community. I was heavily influenced by David Perry at Oregon State University and that whole team, Randy Molina, um, Jim Trappy, who were doing work on mycorrhizal fungi, and I wanted to go back. I thought that this, after my master's, I thought this is where we needed to look, was below ground. And so, you know, these are the mycorrhizal fungi. They're one of four groups of fungi. You guys all know this. There's um, pathogens, there's saprotrophs, there's mycorrhizas. And then there's the end of fights. And I focus on the mycorrhizal fungi, the ones that I call the helper fungi, the ones that all of our trees are in an obligate relationship with in order to um, carry out the life cycle of trees and carry out the life cycle of the fungi. And I learned in the early 1980s about the amazing work that David Reed had done in in the UK, where he had grown pine seedlings together in root boxes in the laboratory and 
inoculated them with a Suillus, I think it was, no, it was a Pisolithus, and found that they would could be connected together. And then he radioactively labeled one of these seedlings over here, and he traced that radioactivity right through this network, right into its neighboring seedling. And he also went so far as to shade these seedlings. He had the idea that this carbon was moving down source sink gradients, like phloem that goes from leaves to roots. They follow the source source of carbon carbohydrates down to sinks where there where those carbohydrates are used and metabolized he had the idea that these networks served like like phloem and xylem in a tree um, and that that carbon would move down these source sink gradients so he went so far as to shade these little neighboring seedlings to different degrees and he found that the more he shaded these seedlings the more carbon actually moved over into this neighboring tree that was amazing that was incredible he published that in nature. Um, and, when, and that was in 1983. I started doing my PhD in 1992, nine years later. And, and really, the work had kind of not gone that far. It was still in the lab. It was still stuck in the UK in these, you know, in root boxes, or people were, were looking at them in grasslands and heathlands, um, but mostly not in big old forests like we're looking at in, in the Pacific Northwest, in Western, in Western North America. And so I wanted to see whether or not these, these networks existed in our forests, and if we were actually dismantling them through our, our very simple forest practices. And just to give you, I, this is just a picture that um, shows these mycelium that can actually link trees together. And now we know that these serve like pipelines, that, that, that the mycelium does have a complex structure, almost like xylem and phloem, where you can get this two-way movement going back and forth between one root and another, where carbon and nitrogen as amino acids and carbohydrates can actually move um, around the outside of a mycelium and, and through the core of the mycelium in two different directions, and that carbon and nitrogen and other compounds like phosphorus and water and anything dissolved in water can move back and forth between these roots. And so I set out to try to see this, to understand this in real forests, in our forests. Um, I started my work in the interior dry belt forests of British Columbia. So these are Douglas fir forests. Um, they're not unlike the coastal forests, except that the Douglas fir here is shade tolerant, whereas on the coast it's more shade intolerant. So when they're shade tolerant, that means that, that regeneration comes up in the understory of the old trees. So these trees here are about 250 to 300 years old, and you can see that there, there's intermediate sized trees that are probably 50 or 100 years old, and then young trees coming up in the understory, the seedlings and saplings. And so this is an uneven age forest. It's highly structured, vertically structured, horizontally structured. And I started my work here um, after doing my initial work with my PhD in multi-species forests. I wanted to come back to these simple, more simple forests, species simple above ground, to try and look at and map what these networks look like below ground in natural forests. So I got a graduate student. His name is Kevin Byler. I worked with Dan Durall. Um, who is another, you know, great mycologist. I worked with Randy Molina, Dan, or Dave Perry, Dave Myrold, all at Oregon State. And we set out to, um, to understand these forests and map what the, the networks look like below ground. So imagine this forest, and now I'm going to shift you over to a, a graphic of what that forest looks like from a below ground perspective. So imagine you're looking down on the forest, and each one of these circles represents a tree. And so the, the bigger and darker the circle is the bigger and older the tree. So this imagine this is a 300-year-old Douglas fir tree. And then these are all smaller trees of younger ages in this uneven age forest. And these little yellow ones are seedlings that are growing up in the network of these old trees. And so just imagine then these old trees, um, of course, they've got cones, they shed seed, the seed falls to the forest floor, those seedlings germinate, they establish, and they actually link into these networks. Um, so these black lines represent actually the fungi that are linking trees together. So you can see this tree here is, um, and keeping in mind, so I'm sorry if I'm a little bit <laughs> jumping around, but keeping in mind that we looked at in this forest where we knew that there were about 100 species of fungi per hectare here, mycorrhizal fungi, we looked at two sister species of rhizopogon, rhizopogon vesiculosus and rhizopogon vinicolor. 
And, um, and so this network that I'm showing you just rep represents those two sister species of Rhizopogon within that community of larger, you know, of many different fungal species that also co-occurred. So if we had been able to map all of the species of fungi, this map would have looked much different. It would have looked more dense, more full, all the interstitial spaces would have been filled with mycelium. So let's look at the characteristics of this network. You know, we analyzed it using graph theory and we looked, we found all kinds of characteristics that are common to complex systems, to systems level thinking or any kind of system. So one of the things we noticed is that these big old trees are hubs in the network. They're the most highly connected. And this is a common feature of systems, whether it's a transportation system, a watershed system, a river system, um, a, a communication system. They all have these characteristics where there are complex systems have hubs in them. So they're the most highly connected. And this particular tree here is actually linked to 80% of the other trees in this forest. And um, these smaller trees, the, the seedlings are less connected, but they are connected in the network of these older trees. And so, as I said, they, they germinate, they, within a three months, we found in our studies, they get colonized by the mycorrhizal fungi, they become part of this network. Um, other features of the network are um, that this is a resilient network. So, you know, you see this tree here is linked to this tree here with multiple linkages. Right? It's not just one fung fungus, one mycelium, it's many, many linkages. And this is what this multiple nodes of connection mean that the system is very resilient. If a columbula comes in and eats off this fungus, or let's say it dies back and then regenerates, it doesn't really, the network is still intact because there are many, many points of linkage. Um, we started experimenting with these networks to see what they do. And around these old trees, we started by planting seedlings or seeds around them to see what they did. And what we found was that when seedlings can establish and join in the network of the old trees, that their survival goes up by between 25% and, and four times. And so it's a significant increase in survival. And why was that? Well, we found that these old trees are actually transmitting resources like carbon and nitrogen and water and phosphorus into these little seedlings. Mm -hmm. And later on, we found out they also transmit information. So if these old trees, for example, are suffering from some kind of herbivore like Western spruce budworm or Douglas fir bark beetle, that these trees will upregulate their own defense uh, machinery, their RNA basically, and they start producing enzymes. These enzymes actually trigger um, a transmission of information from this tree, the, the, the infected tree, to the neighboring trees, and that they in turn, we found, will upregulate their own RNA and start producing enzymes that will protect them against the same insects and pathogens. This kind of work has been done um, in other places around the world, verifying this kind of uh, communication, this information communication. And it's also been done um, in agricultural settings where um, people have found that this kind of defense uh, messaging also goes on above ground. It's not just through mycorrhizal networks, it also happens through above ground pathways. So it's a very robust system, right? There's lots of pathways of communication going on here. Um, Thank you, Suzanne. Yes. There's, there's two questions in the chat about this slide, so I'll just read them to you now. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, one, does the extent of the network shift with seasons? And secondly, it's uh, how did you find the networks and did you core the ground and look at the mycelia? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it shifts with the seasons, but I bet it does. Um, um, of course, people who look at you know, you can use um, different techniques to look at seasonal changes in mycelium. We know that they do the fungi fruit at different seasons, that the mycelium will grow through ingrowth uh, mechanism using ingrowth tubes. We can see that they, that the mycelium grows and at, um, quick, more quickly and more abundantly at different times of the year um, correlated with rainfall. And we've definitely looked at in earlier studies how mushrooms will come up at those rainy seasons around here. It's in June and in October. Um, so yeah, I would think that they do vary with the seasons. The one thing that we did do is when we developed this network map in 2006, um, I had a student, Justine Carson, I had a student, and his name is Joseph Birch, and he went back about 
15 years later and re re looked at this network. He went back into the exactly the same forest, used this network map, and he found that not only do the seedlings respond to the network linkages, but so do the old trees. And we tried to remap the network, but we weren't very successful at it, but we were trying to see how it would have changed over time. But we expect, uh, you know, just based on looking at the trees that there were shifts, there were shifts in emphasis of where carbon would go and how what trees were responding. Um, but I can't answer directly uh, the seasonal question, except to infer from these studies that, that it would change over the seedlings. With respect to the methodology, what we did, what Kevin did, is he went into this forest and, and sampled um, using a grid pattern. So he would sample around each tree in the cardinal directions for the fungi. So doing cores at the basically at the drip line of the trees. And then in between this tree, for example, in this tree, he did multiple cores in between them as well. And in those cores, he picked up whatever fungal material he could get, whether it was mycelium or spores or sclerotia, and, and did what did DNA analysis on them. And it wasn't just sequencing because, you know, you can sequence and get species. What he did was what are called microsatellites. Um, and so microsatellites can actually distinguish one individual genet from another individual genet. And we needed to do that in order to know whether this fungus that was on this tree was actually the same fungus that was on this tree. And we were able to do this only because in random, Randy Molina's lab, he'd work with Annette Kretzer, Kretzer, and she had developed the microsatellites in order for us to actually, you know, distinguish genets of rhizopogon vinicolor and vesiculosis. And so it was work building on work of other people that allowed us to do this. We did the same thing with the trees. So he went in and he collected the cambium of the Douglas fir trees and used microsatellites developed in the lab of Sally Aiken at UBC. And was we were able to distinguish the roots, for example, if he picked up a mycorrhizal root tip uh, here, for example, not only could he identify the individual fungus, he could identify the individual tree that that root was from based on the microsatellites of those Douglas fir individuals. So I hope that answers your question. Um, there's a lot more detail in the journal articles, but yeah, it was very laborious. It was very time consuming. It took Kevin basically five years to do the study to make this map. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, so one question led to another, um, and we kept doing studies. What were the importance of these old trees and finding that they were important in the regenerative capacity of the forest? And so we started calling these old trees mother trees because they were basically nurturing the regeneration of the forest. Um, and, and, you know, this term mother tree, it's, you know, I, I use the term because it helps people remember it to understand the role of regenerative role. Um, but I have to say that, you know, it's not really a scientific term. It's a term, um, you know, Douglas fir is actually has got both sexes in a single tree. Um, and, um, it, but I think that it conjures up in us an understanding. And our, the First Nations people, the, the Aboriginal people of North America, use terms like this in their languages as well. They called them grandmother trees or grandfather trees, mother trees and father trees, or elder trees. Um, and so the, the language is important. It's important for us to understand and convey what we mean about the role of these trees in ecosystems, not just what they are, you know, genetically. So thinking about the role as a regenerative part of the forest. The next question we asked, which I thought was a really logical question, was if these trees can actually facilitate the regeneration of the forest, can they, re can they recognize which ones are their own seedlings? Which ones of these regenerating trees come from these individual trees? Which ones are their own seeds? And this built on work that's being done um, with smaller plants, herbaceous plants um, by others in other parts of the world. And I, I teamed up with one of those scientists. Her name is Dr. Susan Dudley. She's at McMaster University, and she started working on kin recognition in plants, you know, about 20 years ago. And she worked with sea rocket plants, which are a clonal plant. And we got together and we said, well, I wonder, you know, if all these trees are mycorrhizal, if they form networks, and we know that kin recognition based on her work with her graduate students happens through communication through roots. They knew that that was that it was a root communication ability of these trees that allowed them to recognize their relatives 
could this be happening through mycorrhizal networks? And so we did a bunch of experiments and I've, she and I have had three graduate students working together and a postdoc who have dissected this. And we have figured out with her that yes, these trees can actually recognize which ones are their relatives. And the way we know this is because they send, we, we've used carbon tracing and we know that they send more carbon to relatives than to strangers. We know that, that the, the, the relative or the kin seedlings have, um, have bigger mycorrhiz mycorrhizal networks. The fungi on them are more robust. They've got actually more fungal material on them. Um, and also the seedlings are uh, grow faster. They've got more nutrition or different nutrition um, and they survive better. And so what we call that is kin recognition. And the fact that they, that they grow uh, preferably in the neighborhood of their kin leads to this phenomenon called kin selection. That means that there's improved growth in the presence of, of neighbors or of relatives. Okay, so that's really cool. Mycorrhizas are involved in kin recognition in trees. Okay, I'm going to come back then to what First Nations have known all along. Like I said at the beginning, Subie talked about these fungal networks in the soil that the Coast Salish people knew about for a long, long time. And the Coast Salish people had a word for that connection. It's called, we are one, we are all together in this. And it's that word is Netsamotst. Netsamotst means we are all connected. This other word, Hishukish Tawak, is, is actually a Nechamlith word. So those of you who have been keeping track of what's happening in, in, in Ferry Creek and Vancouver Island, the protests by the Nechamlith nation and the, and, and the, uh, and the, the environmental group, the protesters have, you know, come up, you know, talk about this word, about this phenomenon that we are all connected together. So this, this has been known as in the languages. It's, it's, not new, it's not new information to many people, but it's really cool to see this, that the, the, the mycorrhizas are very much of Hishuktish to walk. Okay, I'm going to go back to the salmon forest. Um, and I'm going to try and bring the story together with this last bit about, you know, connection. So along the coast, along the north coast in British Columbia, um, there have been um, many nations who have used this salmon fishing technology called tidal stone traps. And what we're looking at here is actually a, a satellite imagery looking down um, on a forest, obviously, and this, there's a river over here. And what the what the uh, the Haltsuk Nation has done here, the Haltsuk are at Bella Bella, is they've built these stone traps along the coastline. You can see the walls of stone here, and there are many of many miles and miles of these stone traps all along the coastline. And the, what they do is that when the salmon come in on the tide, when they're spawning, they come in on the ebb tide, and or, and when the or sorry on the tide, and when the tide goes out the salmon are trapped behind these stone walls. Um, and so the Haltsuk Nation, the Simsiana, whoever has built the walls, the Tlingit, they do it too. They just passively collect the fish. It's a very simple fishing technology, but it's thousands of years old. Um, so they collect the fish, but they always let the big mother fish go upstream and spawn. And so by doing this, what they were doing is they were actually manipulating the populations um, the, of the salmon. They were actually increasing the health of the salmon populations by favoring the big mother fish. Um, and so keeping this in mind, you know, over the thousands of years of this technology, um, we arrived with colonization happened in North America to these very robust salmon populations that were actually cultured and, and nurtured and managed by the many nations that lived along the Pacific coast. And so, you know, we have images of this. We know that the First Nations depended on salmon as they did with the cedar trees. They go hand in hand. Um, and, um, you know, their livelihoods depended on fishing and drying salmon and using these fish, these passive fishing technologies. And those technologies vary depending a little bit whether you're inland or on the coast, but they were always these passive technologies that, that depended on um, always keeping the big fish so that they could build up the populations. This is one of the um, estuaries in the Haltsuk Nation um, at a place called Hayat. And Hayat is an old 6,000-year-old fishing village um, that is being re, sort of recovered. 
And in this village, they have tidal stone traps out here. You can't see them, um, but but they um, but the salmon will spawn up this river. Um, and they also have clam. There are clam gardens here. Um, there are trees that are cultivated here for cedar bark um, stripping for making canoes. Um, a lot of the villages along the coast also planted a, a number of trees. So you'll find crab apples and. Um, um, uh, salmonberry, thimbleberry, um, blackberries. So the, 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 you can actually, when you're approaching these villages, these ancient villages by boat, you can pick them out really easily because of the deciduous trees, the cultivated plants around them, the stone traps. Um, so we started actually working in these rivers to find out um, what the influence of the salmon were on the forest. And so I have had a PhD student for the last eight years actually working on this, as well as, as a Simsian Nation scientist, Dr. Teresa Ryan, who is also a salmon fishery scientist. And we've been trying to building on the work of scientists in at University of Washington, as well as uh, Simon Fraser University, who have discovered that salmon nitrogen actually ends up in these trees. And we wanted to figure out the pathway where mycorrhizal networks involved in this. And so I'm not going to show you a lot of detail, except to say that the salmon have a deep, deep influence on the mycorrhizal networks. And now we know that, you know, that the salmon the density of salmon in these rivers, and we looked at 23 different rivers up the coast with, that had different numbers of salmon that were spawning in them. It was a natural salmon gradient, and we found that the mycorrhizal fungi varied um, very uh, much along that gradient, that the salmon had a deep influence on the, the identity of the fungi in these forests. Um, they also have a deep influence on the carbon sequestration of these forests and the fertility of the forests. These forests where salmon spawn have some of the highest carbon density of anywhere in the world. We haven't published that data, but we found that and it's really profound. Um, so what happens when the salmon go upriver is that grizzly bears and wolves and eagles will take the salmon that are spawning and they carry it into the forest. And they, um, they eat the salmon, especially under the big old trees. So they tend to go back to the same trees over and over and over again. They can see around them. They can see their predators. They can protect their cubs. And they eat the salmon under these old trees. And so the salmon, actually, the, the flesh of the salmon, which they don't eat most of it, they eat the brains and the guts and they leave the most of the flesh there and it decays and it ends up being up, taken up and acquired by these mycorrhizas and delivered into the tree where we can actually take tree rings then and count the isotopic signature of salmon nitrogen in the tree rings and reconstruct salmon populations over time. It's really difficult to do. It's not easy, um, but we are kind of at the early stages of understanding at least um, what the effect of the salmon has on the fungal populations, the fungal communities, as well as carbon sequestration in these forests. And you can see the salmon bones in the forest. It's really cool when you go into these estuaries, it's not hard to find them. You just crawl along, follow the bear paths, which is what we did, these grizzly bear paths. And sure enough, it's almost predictable. You come up on these little benches and there are the bones. And there are many, many bones on these single sites just shining underneath these big old trees. So it's really cool. It shows the cycle, right? That everything is connected together, that the salmon foster big old trees like this. And they also shade the salmon streams and they provide the detritus, you know, the food web that actually feeds the salmon fry for the next generation of salmon to come. So it is a cycle. It is a linked thing. It's a network. It's a spiral. It all belongs together. Um, and I think, I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, yeah, I guess I took quite a bit of time. But um, yeah, that's my story for today. And I invite any questions that you have. It's super awesome, Suzanne. It's super awesome. And yeah, um, you answered lots of questions, which I would have asked you. But I see that there are lots of very interesting questions in our chat room. And maybe, John, we do it the other way around. You first answer the question of everybody because I think that makes more sense. And then I can still add some if I haven't gotten it from somebody else. Yeah, okay. I'll start with uh, a question from Anita. 
is is there a relationship between moss and the mycorrhizal networks <laughs> that's a great question um so as far as i know mosses don't form mycorrhizas they form risings and the risings um you know, the risings only penetrate so far into the soil or the bark or whatever substrate that they're working on or they're growing on. Um, as far as I know, they don't form a mycorrhiza per se, um, but but I haven't studied this recently. I had a graduate student or, uh, actually working with an undergraduate student up at the Tulik Lake um, research camp uh, way up in the Arctic, and we were trying to figure out whether or not these the, the the mosses were uh were influenced by mycorrhizas and we never actually ended up finishing that study so i i'm sorry that i can't answer it definitively but as far as i know they don't actually they don't actually join into the network but that doesn't mean they aren't part of the same system right um the, the mosses of course will be linked in some other way they they moderate um the temperature of the soil and the forest floor where the fungi grow and of course they would add carbon and nitrogen some of them have nitrogen fixed bacteria associated with them and that will also be important to the fertility of the forest and the tree growth and therefore the mycorrhizal fungi that that form these connections so i haven't i don't know about the direct link but i know that you know indirectly they are all linked they are all in this you know inter interacting with each other okay next question uh does the novel the overstory represent the science of your work accurately and fairly <laughs> um, you know, I love the or over story. I thought it was a wonderful book. I think that, um, you know, th that character, uh, 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 Patricia Westerford, um, from what I understand from hearing, listening to Richard Powers interviews is a combination of me as well as a couple of other people. Um, so it's not just me. And, and I think that character reflects that. Um, the research I did was on mycorrhizas and fungal connections. And what Patricia was, was actually studying were, was communication above ground. And so, you know, I mentioned that other researchers were actually working on this, you know, that trees will warn each other through emitting uh, volatile organic compounds that other trees detect through through the air, um, which is a more general way of communication than the more specific avenues through mycorrhizas. And so in some ways, you know, um, she she did represent me, but in, in the, the details, no, not really, <laughs> not the details of my research. And uh, of course, you know, Patricia also was faced with a number of personal ad adversities in her career. And I think that in the end, she didn't actually um, make it through, right? She, I mean, she, she did get her voice back, but not in a really powerful way. And I'm hoping that I can get a little bit further than Patricia did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I chime in to this? So, is there a um, sort of um, interaction or talking between trees over the air? Well, yeah, there are. So there's so these volatile organic compounds. You know, we all smell them when we're walking through the forest. We all smell these organic compounds when we when we when we when we breathe in the scents, right? Um, and and those are communication molecules. And so what people have done is they, especially in in uh, shrubs and herbaceous plants, is they've they've um, purposely injured these plants and then measured these VOCs that transmit through the air and the neighbors pick them up. And so, yeah, I mean, it does happen. It's been well verified. It's been studied a lot. Um, and it's been known for, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 years now okay. before we knew about the mycorrhizal connection and that communication pathway. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A question from Rachel Friedman, uh, who did her undergraduate uh, research with uh, Jim Trapp. Okay. And she would like to, she's curious about your use of the term mycorrhizas. And can you help understand the difference between that and the multiple mycorrhizae? <laughs> Mycorrhizae and mycorrhizas? Yes. You know, I, I, that's, I, I think that the mycorrhizas is more of a European use of the word and mycorrhizae is more North American. Um, that's how I've figured, kind of figured it out. Uh, they both mean the same thing. It's just the plural of a mycorrhiza. They're okay. interchangeable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. got to process one other question. Um, let's see. Does your research explain why some species like chanterelles often fruit only when the trees are above a certain age. 
you know, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I knew that you guys are going to ask me questions that I couldn't answer, but um, <laughs> um, I would expect so, um, but I don't know for sure. I haven't studied that. But, you know, th think about, you know, chanterelles as all mycelium, all mushrooms depend on carb carbohydrates from the trees. You know, they, they don't survive without them, except as maybe rusting spores and sclerotia. And so the more carbo carbohydrates that are fixed through photosynthesis by the trees, the more carbon ends up below ground. It's just, you know, it about, and it depends on the ecosystem you're in, um, but anywhere between 20 and 80% of, of, of photosynthate ends up below ground in the soil food web and, the, and in the mycelium. And in more drier or poor ecosystems, the more carbon goes down there. In more replete ecosystems, like, you know, for example, coastal rainforests, that number will go down. There'll be less allocated below ground because trees can get their resources. They're more plentiful, so they can get them more easily. Um, what we found in our studies in the Mother Tree Project is that about half of the carbon in our Douglas fir forest ends up below ground. Almost, yeah, it doesn't really matter. You know, there's a slight response from dry to wet where there's a little bit more allocated below ground in drier forests compared to wetter forests, but it's pretty much a 50-50 thing. Um, but, you know, so getting back to the question, yeah, the more carbohydrate that ends up in the mycelium, um, the more that will be available for fruiting. And um, so I, I think, you know, without studying it, that's a general principle that you could apply to understanding chanterelle um, fruiting. But, you know, that's as far as I can, I can shed light on that as far as I know. Uh, do you have any data or just your personal observations? Like if you have a clear cut and then the clear cut regrows either from alone naturally or because they plant trees or whatever, at what point, so after how many years will you mm -hmm. find fruiting of the mushrooms which were there before, which mm -hmm. don't show up as a clear cut? I mean, this is like you know, a desert kind of thing <laughs> doesn't look yeah. very good. There's nothing come popping up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be definitely a thing which mushroom people would want, want to know. know because some of our nice, you know, hunting crowns got wasted, you know? Yeah, uh, I know. Um, so we did a, a chrono sequence in the mixed, for, mixed Douglas fir birch forest in the interior of BC, and we got data on this. So we actually only followed from a clear cut to a hundred year old forest, um, but we got uh, clear cut five, 20, 50, hundred year old forests and, and a few in between, um, well replicated study. And we found that um, uh, and we looked at the DNA of the mycorrhizal fungi below ground. We also looked at the mushrooms. The, looking at the below ground uh, mycelium and, and the root tips gave us a clearer picture because it's hard to follow mushrooms, but um, because they vary so much from year to year, as you all know. Um, but what we found is that, um, that, yeah, in the first few years, the first five to 10 years after clear cutting, you go from a, a forest that has about 100 species per hectare of fungi, fungal species, mycorrhizal fungi, in general, on average, to about four or five. And those four or five are, you know, don't require a lot of carbon. They're things like Thalephora and Wilcoxina, um, um, what is it, Pizazli, Pizales. Um, they're really, really simple fungi. And then, uh, or in low carbon demanding fungi. And then over time, the, the fungal community starts to recover and rhizopogon starts to come on maybe at 10 years. Um, but the, the full suite, the diversity of that community doesn't really recover until the forest is at least 50 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I would say you start to see a, a fuller community of the, of, the, of the fruiting bodies. And then it just grows from there. It kind of starts to level off. And so by a century, you're almost fully recovered from what we can tell. And, and then, you know, as the forest gets older and older, of course, um, there are more fungi, more rare fungi are added onto that diversity list, that richness list. Um, and so, you know, even a hundred year old forest is not going to fully represent what was, what was there naturally in an old growth forest. But so just to summarize, about 50 years is when we start to see on, you know, a, a fuller recovery, almost a full recovery of the community. Yeah, and that is super sad for me because I won't be alive then anymore. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I know. And, you know, uh, of course, you see some things like morels come up following fire. And, you know, in it's funny, I was I, my daughter, I've got two daughters and they're they've become both in forestry. And one of my daughters was working up north, north of Prince George. And there were huge fires when she was up there um, and large clear cuts. And, um, and <laughs> you know, they've, they've clear cut like so much, but instead of forestry now, it's basically mushroom pickers that are up there. And there are huge camps of mushroom pickers um, it's regul it's unregulated for the most part, and they're picking morels, and they're selling like it's a huge market. And in fire years, that that community is massive, and so yeah, there's a lot of mushrooms um, after clear cutting, but they're mostly morels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is in some ways also nice, but if everything just looks like a desert, that doesn't you know make any sense. It's it's not good for anything. So no. yeah. And even if you love morels, I do think that most <laughs> of us would agree that cannot be the goal that we just burn everything down to get morels. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And that definitely was never the goal. It was just like we didn't, they didn't care at all about mushrooms. It's just that it's, you know, they popped up. And so then the whole community of, of this sort of underground community of uh, um, unregulated, um, but, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, people that but, are trying to make money from the land yeah well yeah taking the opportunity because it's mm -hmm. there and it tastes really good but since we talked about fires since you mentioned forest fires what's your take mm -hmm. on them um i mean we have more and more coming because of the climate change and whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um do you think we have to change or the forest industry has to change something well, yeah what what would you recommend what would be done yeah it's a, it's a it's a it's a complex problem. It's a wicked problem. Um, you know, we've had a huge fire year up here this year in British Columbia. In my little town of Nelson, you know, in July and August, I was surrounded by five huge fires. I mean, we couldn't even breathe for like a month. Um, people were migrating from the interior to the coast just to breathe. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this is going to, last year wasn't so bad, but the year before and the year before that, it was, a, it was again, a disaster. We had like millions of hectares burning. This is the future. The future is now. It's here. Um, there's so much we can do to mitigate this. So, um, you know, for one, you know, one of the things that we've found or people are talking about this year that we've noticed and people have, and I've been talking about this for a long time as of other people, but um how we cultivate our, how we clear cut and then replace old forests with Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, spruce, you know, simplified monocultures, and then weed out the broadleaf trees. We're actually increasing the flammability of these, of the landscape. Um, so not, not just, you know, the, you know, the individual clear cuts have, are highly flammable, but the pattern of clear cuts, that so there's one after the other, after the other means that the fire, once it starts, it just rages through the landscape. Um, and then without big old trees there, which have thick bark um, and deeper root systems, which actually are resistant to fire, fire, at least in the interior part of the province, they, when they're there, they help the forest recover. Obviously, they provide seed, but the roots actually will bring water up from down below and share it through the mycorrhizal network mm -hmm. with the other plants and trees and keep the forest moist. And of course, trans also keeps the forest moist. There's so many things that do that. And the fires that are burning through these clear cuts are actually drying out the landscape. Um, so what can we do? We can leave big old trees, even when we harvest, like do partial cutting and leave old trees. They'll, they'll host the mycorrhizal fungi and they'll also, you know, help the landscape resist fire. Um, so there's resilience and resistance built into leaving old trees and then not planting them to monocultures of flammable trees, like having mixes of broadleaves and conifers of all these species also will really help. And of course, on top of that, you know, we need to reduce our rate of cutting so that we don't have a sea of land of, of clear cuts out there. We need to address our fossil fuel consumption so that we can decarbonize our energy sector. We need to address the, this heating of our atmosphere so we don't 
have fires that are being created by other fires. So essentially, you know, it's become so hot and dry that when we get a fire, it creates lightning itself, which spawns even more fires, which sounds like a disaster, and it is, but we do have tools, right? We do know that if we leave old trees and don't create these vulnerable clear cuts plantations, that we can mitigate the spread of fire. There's there are things we can do. Right. There's lots more questions from the audience. Yeah. I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Um, this is this is from Pete Allen, and it's a it's a question that I had uh, prepared also. Um, but essentially, it 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 comes down to we can see trees all the time. We can rarely see mushrooms. More, I guess, if you're looking for them, but they're they're not so obvious. And so, as we look at this relationship, like who's in charge? Are the, is it the trees that are mm. kind of telling the mushrooms what to do or are the mushrooms telling the trees what to do or is it truly a symbiotic, uh, symbiotic network? Or does anybody know? What do you think? <laughs> oh, it's definitely the mushrooms that are in charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we're mushroom nerds here. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I would say they're both involved. They're both involved. All of them are involved. You know, there, there isn't anybody in charge. It's a complex system. It's about the relationships between all of them. You know, as a forester, I studied how trees regulate trans transmission of carbon back and forth through mycorrhizas. And everything I did, you know, I, I manipulated these source sink gradients by shading, by using nutrients, by using varying species, by varying the, the water capacity of the soil. Everything mattered. Right. It all influenced what went where. So definitely what the status of the trees is important, whether they're big or small or rich or poor, that all matters. So does the mycorrhizal networks. The identity of fungi in those networks also matters, whether it's, you know, full of Wilcoxin or full of rhizopogon, that matters. And so who's in charge? Well, they're all working together. It's about their relationships. And, you know, we have to, you know, try to to stop ourselves from trying to think simply about the system and say it's one or the other. We need all of these things together. Nice. Okay. And of course, the mycorrhizal people study the mycorrhizal. I mean, you know, if you look at one thing, you'll find it. And, you know, the, the challenge is look at all these things together, right? That's really hard to do. That's where the next studies need to go. Yes. Who Who is, like, what's the title for somebody who's doing that? Because the foresters aren't necessarily doing it and the mushroom people aren't doing it. Um, like who's doing it? Like the ecologists? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I'm a forester. I'm a forest ecologist. I guess the ecologists, they're the ones that look at relationships between different species. So yeah, it's on them, but really it's the, it's, you know, it was really the, the, my, the, the mycophiles who started this. It wasn't the tree people who started looking at this. It's you guys that, that, that spawned the questions, right? And then the rest of us are trying to understand the ecosystem, say, oh, you know, these mycophiles, these micro, micro, mycorrhizae people, they know something about the below ground world. Maybe I should look there. And so then we start looking at the relationship between our trees and your fungi, and we find out that they're both important. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's people getting together and doing the work together is really important to this collaboration. And I have to say that, you know, as an I started out in government, and now I'm an academic. Academia is not the place to do collaborative work, unfortunately. You know, academia needs to be completely restructured so that it honors and fosters collaborative work. Um, it doesn't do that. Um, so it's really up to us as individuals to seek out those collaborations and try to do them. Uh, work, you know, work with scientists and, and naturalists and government people and academic people, everybody together as much as, you know, as much as we can. Okay. Lots more questions, but I'm going to ask this, even though nobody brought it up, even though I know that I want to know, um, do you still play goalie and drink beer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about my beer right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so um, what would you hope that um, your work would inspire in a, a group of amateur mycologists like KPMS with 200 plus uh, membership families um, to do going forward? You know, I, I think it, 
Well, education is huge. So talk to your, you know, talk to your friends, spread the word, get the education material out there, get people out in the forest to look at these creatures, right? Because once you get people out there, they, they fall in love with it right away. You probably all know this already. Um, you know, get people so they're hooked into looking for mushrooms. Um, and then, so that's number one. The, the second thing, and maybe this is most important, is that we need to protect our forest. Forests. Like without forests, we don't have any fungi, we don't have mushrooms, and our forests are disappearing really, really rapidly. I mean, I think that in the US, you've made some progress by, um, you know, in some ways, by, um, you know, there's new forestry that Jerry Franklin started, and that that started with, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest Forest Plan, which protected some forest. Um, up in Canada, we're still clear cutting as though, you know, our lives depend on it, <laughs> um, when our lives actually depend on saving these for us. And, um, and we have a lot to learn. And, and so I think that the, a lot of energy has got to be going into protecting the forest, saving the old growth that we have um, as, as much as we can. Like this is, it's dire, it's essential. So that's, I spend a lot of time actually supporting people who are out protesting um, against logging. I support, you know, I, I'm more and more, you know, as we see our forest disappearing so rapidly, this is, this is where we need to put our energy and without the trees, we don't have the fungi. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, another question from Bob Johnson. Um, uh, you mentioned the salmon influence on the forest. And can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about how does the, forest influence the estuary and the ocean and uh, what are the connections between the forest and the sea? I mean, okay. Yeah. Um, so that they're in, of course they're linked. Uh, the ocean forest interface is a very active place. <laughs> Lots of people live there because there's a lot of activity. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of species there. All ecotones have those kind of features. Um, salmon are the vector that go between the forest and the ocean. Um, and so, you know, if, if the salmon are being overfished in the ocean, that means there's less salmon going into the forest and less salmon that is fertilizing uh, the forest, the mycorrhizas, the networks. Um, fewer bears are able to survive, fewer eagles, fewer wolves. Um, so it, it trickles all the way up the food chain and all the way down the food chain. Um, and when the forests are less fertile because there's fewer salmon, that means that this, the, 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 the rivers are also less fertile. Um, and especially, you know, if we're clear cutting these forests as well, which we're doing as fast as we possibly can, um, then the food web of, of the streams is disrupted because the food web of the streams is driven by the litter fall that's coming from those trees and from the roots and the, the euphoric zone and where water moves back and forth from the tree to the stream in these underground channels. Um, and so, you know, if, if the trees are not there or they're less productive, that translates automatically into the fertility of the streams, which affects the ability of the salmon to spawn and, and the fry to grow and then go back out to the ocean. So overfishing, over, over harvesting, those things interact. And we've seen the decline in the salmon populations, actually the, the crashing of the sockeye salmon populations. And this is going to affect the forest. And I'm just going to, I'm going to actually, um, because I don't know a lot of detail about it, but what we are doing, <laughs> I mean, this is an interesting study. My um, my research associate, Teresa Ryan, who is a Simpson woman, who's a salmon fishery scientist, um, what we're doing <laughs> to try and get a handle on this question is um, when, so when colonization happened in North America, in Canada, what happened was that the, that the confederation is that the government basically tried to um, destroy the Indians. They, they put the children in residential schools and they also, you know, we started logging our forests and we started fishing the oceans. And basically the fisheries department of fisheries and oceans in Canada took the, the, 
took the resource, the, the salmon resource away from the First Nations. They basically plowed in those, those tidal stone traps and said, you can't use them anymore. We're taking over the fishery from here. And that happened in the early 1900s. And so now, and so then they said, okay, we're going to manage the fishery. Well, we know what happened from there. The salmon populations crashed. We overfished the salmon. We didn't uh, fish on, on the tidal cycles. We didn't passively fish. We, we harvested everything. Um, and so now what we're doing, my po- Teresa and I, is we're going back to these old tidal stone traps and we're reconstructing some of them. And we're doing them in some of these really rich salmon rivers, and we're going to track how that, and we're going to, in reinstating and revitalizing these stone traps and using the old fishing technologies, we're going to trace, using nitrogen tracers, how that's affecting the nitrogen productivity of those estuaries, and we're going to be tracing how that affects the productivity and the nitrogen capacity of those forests. So we're trying to answer that question. Um, it's not diff- It's not easy. Um, doing any kind of work with Aboriginal people means that there's there's all kinds of you know there's all kinds of history to to um, to to grapple with and even going you know going even with the First Nations people who are collaborating with you um, you know these are these are archaeological sites right these. T- tidal stone traps are thousands of years old. It's like going and doing an archaeological dig for a dinosaur, right? It's that historical. And so it's taken us three years just to get the permits to go in there and start doing our work. So yeah, it's 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 painful work. It's difficult work. It's, it's laborious work. It's going to take a long time. But we have our hypothesis, which I just laid out for you. We think that these things are intimately interlinked, and we're going to try and verify that um, with, our, with our measurements. We probably need more from the First Nation young people who study that and want yeah. to do it themselves, because then it's their land, it's their heritage, and then they, their interest is the biggest to keep it or better to fix it up again. It's exactly. And, you know, we're so we're going to be working with the health sick youth um, with these three stone traps. They're going to be rebuilding the stone traps. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, just say one little quote from a health sick woman, um, um, Jess H- H- Husty. And she's a mother and she's, uh, uh, she lives in Bella Bella. She's, you know, she's, got, she's a scientist as well. And she, so she's been trained as a Western scientist as well. She's an Aboriginal scientist. And she talks about how Western science is the little sister of Aboriginal science. And really, we have a lot of learning working with them to learn about these, these systems, to learn about this worldview, to change our own worldview so that we can revitalize our own world um, and, and move into a more productive society. Yeah. That's, uh, you, it's almost like Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, braiding yes. thing, yeah. Uh, two very specific questions exactly. from Sue. Did your investigations find any mycorrhiza interface with uh, rhododendrons? And secondly, how does the soil type influence the distribution of the mycorrhizal uh, relationships and abundance? Yeah, so I haven't, I, I don't actually look at these ericoid mycorrhizas myself, but um, one of my PhD students did it for, did for her, her master's uh, research. And Shannon Birch, who is actually a trained mycologist from Oregon State and, uh, and works in uh, in our government in Canada now. I think she might be retired now. Did, you know, did a lot of work with road with with ericoid mycorrhizas and rhododendron and salal, um, especially. And um, yeah. So, what specifically was the question? Sorry, I'm, I'm I don't know a lot about them. I mean, I know that they. You know, these are very specialized mycorrhizal fungi. They're cer- only certain species, a, a low number of species. They're, they're not just mycorrhizas. They also um, can decompose organic material so that, the, that these plants can uptake organic nutrients. Um, they're essential in, you know, the productivity of these forests, but I, I don't study them myself. Was there another part to that question? Uh, a soil type on mycorrhizal. Yeah. Um, so I would say that more than so soil type. What does that mean, right? <laughs> um, in 
you know, in, in Canada, we have all these soil orders. They're genetic soil orders. I know that you have soils that are developed in the same way. Um, we have glaciated soils. Most of the American soils are not glaciated. So that makes a difference whether they're glaciated or not. Glaciated soils tend to be poorer soils. They're younger soils. They're less weathered. Um, um, and so the mycorrhizas that form on those soil types, um, I think, are, are um, you know, they, they're, they're good at um, extracting nutrients from difficult situations, from poor soils. Um, and so, and also as you move north, we get into more boreal forests and the mycorrhizas and the, the plant community changes. Um, and so those soils are, are even younger and they're, they're even more nutrient poor um, and there's a lot more ericoid mycorrhizas in those communities um, and then as you move southward and go into the tropical forest you get you move from like more ericoid to ecto in these temperate forests to more uh, or buscular mycorrhizal dominated communities and tropical forests that's very general of course um, but that tells you that those associated with those changes are changes in, in soil soil type as well so you'll go from you know these deep organic soils in the boreal forest to pozolic soils or spotosols as you call them in the u.s in the temperate forest to more uh and or, or luvisols and brunisols, that's what we call them in our temperate forests, down to lateritic soils in the tropical forests. And so the mycorrhizals change along that gradient too. So what drives that? Um, what is it? Is it soil or climate? I mean, they all do work together, but climate, I would say, is the number one factor that affects uh, soil weathering, soil um, soil development, and then the plant community that's on them, and that plant community is associated with a certain mycorrhizal community. But, you know, to sort out the hierarchy of these things, um, I think climate is the number one thing, soil is the next thing, and then the plant community is, is the thing next after that, if we were to hierarchy, put them in a hierarchy of importance. Awesome. Can I, can I pop in a thing? Um, you know, with the clear cuts, we don't change the soil, but we change uh, the plants which wander in, like Scott broom or like <laughs> ivy, do those things change the mycorrhizae then also? Because yeah. you could yeah, argue the mycorrhizae are underground, they sit there and they wait until things grow back and then they do more action, but mm -hmm. maybe not because they don't have any host trees. What is yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those weedy plants, like, I, you know, I, I think Scotch broom is an ericaceous plant. Um, um, ivy, it's probably, it's either arbuscular mycorrhizal or maybe, it, you know, some of these weedy plants are non-mycorrhizal. A lot of weedy plants yeah, are either non-mycorrhizal or arbuscular mycorrhizal, whereas our forests are generally more ectomycorrhizal, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. And so it's a wholesale shift from a whole functional group of mycorrhizas to another functional group of mycorrhizas. So of of course, that's going to influence, you know, the, the productivity of that site, as well as the ability of the of the plants to uptake nutrients from the soil. It'll have a profound effect. And one, okay, here's one story I can tell. Um, when I was a younger researcher in the government, I, I did all these crazy experiments. And actually, I talk about one of them in the book where I actually made a big mistake and I destroyed this site. I, I actually... Um, in my zeal to create this perfect experiment, I got rid of the forest floor and all these weeds moved in and the mycorrhizal community completely changed from our, from ectomycorrhizal to arbuscular mycorrhizal. I couldn't get conifers to come back. I kept planting over and over and over again. And it was like I created this black hole and it's because the whole my mycorrhizal community had changed and it was only when I was able to transfer soil back from the forest into that clear cut could I regenerate the forest yeah. so yeah I mean how we change the plant community changes the mycorrhizas which really affects you know the recovery of that of that plant community mm -hmm. yeah uh Another question from John Blindauer. Um, how does forest thinning affect the health of the remaining trees in the short term? <laughs> and how does the removal of the large mother trees versus thinning out the overcrowded smaller trees affect the eventual rebound of the same forest? Yeah, I think, um, you know, these big old trees, um, you know, they, they have the big crowns. They, they're highly photosynthetic. They support, you know, a kind of a more, a more diverse community of mycorrhizal fungi 
of more, you know, the older the tree, the more of these kind of old growth or multi-stage fungi you get on them versus younger, smaller trees that don't have that photosynthetic capacity, can't support the same diverse community as the old trees. And so, um, so really, um, and, and these younger trees that sort of in Douglas fir forests, especially where we do a lot of fire suppression, we get a lot of these young trees growing up under the understory of the old trees. And they, they kind of sap these old trees of their vitality. They compete for water. They take up water. They take up space. Um, and, and, you know, I think that if we're going to be restoring these communities, it's to keep the old trees and, you know, get get rid of the understory through prescribed burning, and that will revitalize the forest and it will help the mycorrhizal community become more diverse. So, I mean, it's not going to be the same prescription everywhere, but I think in general and looking at our forests up in Canada and these dry belt forests where this has happened with, with fire suppression, this is what we need to do. We really need to restore um, prescribed burning as the Aboriginal people did a long time ago to, to bring back the resistance, the resilience of these forests and increase the diversity of the below ground community. Great. Uh, let's see. Going down. Okay. This is from Aaron. Good question. That humans always get a bad rap. Are there any obvious positive roles that humans play amongst the forest networks? Totally. <laughs> I think that the Aboriginal example of the salmon is a great one, you know, where we they have this reciprocal relationship between the salmon, the forest, and their own communities. Right. And they can, and we, we as human beings, we can cultivate really robust communities. We're, we're geniuses at this. Um, we also go, the, but we also get it led astray and we explore, we, where it can be exploitive. But if we can get back to more of this productive role, um, yeah, we can have a hugely positive influence. And one of the things that we really need to do um, as climate is changing is that, you know, the velocity of climate change is so much faster than trees can adapt or migrate. The, it's going to be our job to help trees move. We're going to have to be planting genotypes, you know, in 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 different climates in order for these trees to stay uh, healthy and alive, and to keep the forest vivacious, you know, vi vi vital, and to ability to keep sequestering and storing carbon. If we don't do that, we're hooped. You know, we have to do that, and we can do that. You know, we we've studied it. We you know there are good scientists out there who understand that. But when we move these trees, we need to move them into receptive communities. So it can't be like into you know clear cuts that are devoid of other plants and mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria and, and the soil food web. They have to go into healthy environments. And so that means that you know retaining these old trees and then migrating uh, genotypes into them into these always intact networks. Um, so yeah, we're going to have to play a role in that. We have to play a very productive role in that. Okay. Um, some of the invasive and non-native uh, species are allopathic for plants. Uh, is, is there something similar that's true for fungi? That fungi can be allelopathic, you mean, for other fungi? Or, um, well, let me take let me take this a little bit. Um, so, one of the things, so, you know, a lot of noxious weeds are can be uh, allelopathic. Um, so that means that they can create they can um, produce chemicals that prohibit or inhibit other plants from establishing around them. Um, there's even native. <laughs> trees and plants that do that. Um, you know, there's the famous example of the black walnut, which produces a compound called juglans, which, um, you know, inhibits other plants from growing in the understory of, of, of black walnut trees. Um, but there's one story I'm thinking of, and that's with knapweed, where knapweed is a very noxious weed. It's very invasive. Um, it can even invade into intact grasslands and intact forests, even when there's no disturbance there. And one of the ways that and this was scientists actually in Montana that looked at this, that, that they do this is that they have our buscular mycorrhizal networks. And these arbuscular mycorrhizal networks actually tap into the, the arbuscular networks of the native grasslands. And the knapweed will steal the phosphorus right out of those grasses. And that allow, and it kills the grasses and allows them to invade into those, into those intact communities. And so in a sense, the, the, the fungi are working in concert with the knapweed to invade and be, and it's kind of a, it's, I, 
Is it allelopathic? Is it poisonous? Um, well, certainly a Napoli community looks pretty poisonous to me. There's not much that can grow around them. So, um, yeah, I think that there are examples of, of that, but I'm not an expert in this area at all. So, yeah. Okay. Another question. Uh, you, you talk in your book about um, your, your research and your methods about using uh, Western red cedars uh, that form our buscular mycorrhiza. Mm -hmm. um, as a control. Mm -hmm. And then, so, so currently is it, is it thought that um, our buscular mycorrhizal networks are completely independent from uh, ectomycorrhizal networks? Um, or do some fungi and plants participate in both? Yeah, there, there are. Um, um, so there's some plant, some tree species and shrub species that form both arbuscular and ectomycorrhizas. So willows, for example, uh, in the populus genus, uh, eucalyptus is another one. Um, so, so there's not very many, but there are some. And, um, and also we know that when, so this was done in Dave Perry's lab where you grow, for example, Douglas fir in a grassland full of arbuscular mycorrhizas that that Douglas fir can form what are putative arbuscular mycorrhizas when that doesn't, when that's absent of other ectomycorrhizal inoculum. And so the, the neighborhood of, of the, of the tree matters. Um, and the community that is trying to grow in matters. They can actually form these kind of weird mycorrhizal associations, what they, they don't, don't normally do. Um, in the ericoid ectomycorrhizal association, there are fungi that can form an ericoid mycorrhiza on an ericaceae plant and an ectomycorrhizal on an ectomycorrhizal tree and actually join them together. Um, so that's kind of weird, but cool. Um, so those are just a few stories I, you know, where they can be quite flexible and it depends on the environment that they're in and the plant community. Context matters. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Kirsten, what else you got? Uh, I see so many other questions. You really want me to do it? No, I'm I'm just trying to copy all those down. So if you if you can, if I can switch one in, okay. Um, well, you know, I was reading in your book mainly about, um, or what kind of popped out for me was this one thing. You mentioned Darwin and his words and his works and that he is kind of always only interpreted as a, you know, survival of the fittest and just competition. Mm -hmm. And you put out this completely different um, looking at this, that he is also, also talking about um, working together and collaboration Mm -hmm. almost reciprocity and so how do you think we can change our thinking from this because this is like in not only the forest industry this is also like an agriculture pretty much everywhere we humans work we mm -hmm. think it has to be all competition but it should be more mm -hmm. collaboration so how do you think we change this because we need to change it in order yeah. to survive, I guess. Yeah. You know, competition, collaboration, they happen all at once, all at the same time, right? So you can have, you know, tr two trees side by side that are collaborating and competing together. Yeah. So it's it's simultaneous. It's it's complex. Um, so to say it's one or the other is 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 false too. So um, so it's it's multifarious. And um, how do we change our mindset? I think that scientifically we've made the shift. <laughs> I think that um, even, you know, we, we now know that, you know, the evolution of eukaryotic cells was really a symbiosis from the very beginning. Um, we know from the Human Genome Project that we're full of viral DNA and bacterial DNA. We're not just like individuals. Yeah. Um, and... <laughs> um, and so we've made that shift. We've made we we have that understanding. It's the translation of that knowledge into practice that's the difficult part. Um, so we've you know we've got this huge, as you say, infrastructure in forestry and agriculture, aquaculture as well, where you know we've designed all these practices on this basis that we need to get rid of competitors or you know to simplify these systems. And so we really need it needs to be like I guess you know we need to be advocate or do we need to we need to really educate people and advocate for these changes because it's killing us to be so simple um we need to become more sophisticated in what we do and 
And what we're fighting against is this built up infrastructure around this idea of competition, right? The herbicide companies, the genetic companies, the fertilizer companies, you know, it's a huge, big business and they're going to be resistant to change. Um, but we've got to, you know, I guess at the grassroots start making these influences. We've got to, you know, make these changes and we don't, we can't linger. We've got to do it. We've got to do it quickly. <laughs> Maybe even change the laws because we cannot sue on behalf of a tree. We can sue on behalf of a, um, a ship. A, yes. Yeah, you know, I mean, we cannot sue on behalf of a river, of a forest who is taken away. I mean, like the First Nations, can they sue us, the incoming people, you know, we mess it up. Um, so there is no... Um, it's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. But you know, our our health is being impacted by these, you know, these kind of backward policies, like the fires, for example. You know, we can we can, you know, if it's if I can't breathe, and if if I die or my kids die, or you know, and people are dropping dead from this, like in Vancouver during the heat wave, there were eight hundred people that dropped dead in about two days just from heat exhaustion. Huh. And, and so, you know, it is affecting our human health. And so then, you know, when we humans, we can, you know, we can advocate for our own selves, but it, it is really about conservation of our natural ecosystem. So I don't think it's a hopeless situation, but we do need more direct avenues to uh, put value on our health, our public health, our public ecosystems. Um, yeah. yeah. The laws do need to change. And I think that I, I'm actually working with some lawyers right now in trying to sue the government of Canada, of British Columbia, because, you know, they're going to cut down Ferry Creek. And Ferry Creek is like our last iconic old growth forest left on Vancouver Island. And it's a huge storehouse for carbon and biodiversity. And what, what that lawsuit is trying to do is change the law so yeah. that you can actually sue on the behalf of, of the public health, not just on the individual actions of the police, for example, or, yeah. you know, or the forest company. Yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. So maybe we should go up there and climb in trees and live there so that they can cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people are doing. Honestly, tomorrow there's going to be a huge protest of elders, you know, uh -huh. people that are, you know, you know, in their retiring years, and they're going to march up that Ferry Creek Road to, you know, to stand with the young protesters. You know, it, it is all of us. And we, you know, people are putting their lives on the line, like people that there was an elder woman, <laughs> I'm just going to give this example, um, who drove her car to Ferry Creek yesterday to put to stand with the young protesters, these 20 and 30 year old kids. And, um, and she was pulled out of her car by the police. And then the forest company drove their skitter over top of the car and crushed, crushed it. Wow. I mean, it's it's like, you know, it's like the it's like the Taliban for Pete's sakes, right? Like, what are we doing? It's crazy, and we need to change these. We need to change this. We people are trying to stand up for the health of their kids, for themselves, for their families, and and the governments are not, and the industries are not responding, and they need to respond. Yeah. And people are going to dramatic, uh, you know, dramatic ends to make them respond. And I think it's going to change, but it's going to take a lot of pain. Uh, but we have to keep pushing a lot of people doing yeah yeah huh that's cool <laughs> okay, all right John? one more question from drew haven do you have any advice for aspiring science communicators uh, i'm reading your book right now and i'm so interested in the process of integrating the research and results into a narrative that is broadly accessible yeah, you know, like I, I wrote in my book, I never really thought of myself as a communicator. But, you know, over time, as I've gained more knowledge and confidence, I've become something like that. And, um, and it really is just, you know, take your heart and put it out there and stand up for what you believe in. And if you do that, people will listen to you. Um, you don't need special skills, you just need to practice doing it. And that's all I did. Um but if you if you're more you know if you can get some training and uh, become more outgoing if you're introverted like I am um, you know make yourself do it and practice it over and over again then you can start 
to have an influence and not just using one mode of communication, but many modes of communication. So, you know, I started out, you know, giving talks and then I started teaching and then I started doing videos and then I did a TED talk and then I wrote a book and it was kind of this step-by-step process for me. Um, but if you're, when you're younger, if you could start out earlier saying, this is what I want to do, you'll be way more effective, right? Than sitting in your scientific lab and doing, you know, taking decades to get to that point. I think it's really important that people do speak out, that you learn how to do that, to speak up for the forest, because it really needs us to do that. All right. There, there are uh, many more questions. We had a great turnout uh, tonight for your presentation, Suzanne. So thank you so much for being here. But I think, um, I think 90 minutes is is more than um, more than we were hoping to get. So hold on, John. Hold on. One more thing. Oh yeah. What's that? Girl? Mother tree project. Can you explain oh, a little yeah. bit about yeah. that? And because yeah. that's another a really cool way of that people can get involved. So yeah. I let you talk. Carbon yeah. Mastering. You know, the, that's a great question, and I'm happy to answer that question. Um, so the Mother Tree Project is is a project I started about six years ago, and the objective is to how do we manage our forests so that they remain resilient as climate changes? That's the overall question. And I came, I, I started it from my understanding of how networks, mycorrhizal networks work in forests. And so the idea is how do we conserve these networks? And, and keeping in mind that mycorrhizas are a symbol of all the connections in forests. There's other microbial networks, there's bird networks, there's stream networks, there's all kinds of networks, all these connections. How do we conserve these? And keeping in mind that trees are the photosynthetic machinery that feeds these ecosystems. That's where the energy comes from. So we need to conserve these old trees and we can do this in different ways. And so we started playing around with you know, versus clear cutting, what's an alternative to clear cutting? Well, we can leave individual trees, we can leave groups of trees, we can leave large contiguous patches of trees, we can leave the forest intact. And so we're comparing all of these kinds of ways of leaving old trees and their networks intact um, across different climatic, or a climatic gradient that goes from the hot, dry communities near the 49th parallel, all the way up to cold, wet communities in the subboreal forest. Um, we have forests now that we're continuing this network up into the coastal ecosystems as well. And we've harvested them in different ways in collaboration with community forests, First Nations forests, um, industrial forests, research forests. We have like tons of collaborators. And um, we go in and we do this harvesting, we plant them to these migrated genotypes and many, many species trying to create resilient forests. And then we're measuring the impacts on the carbon cycle, on the water cycle, on the biodiversity and the regenerative capacity of the forest. Um, so this project has been funded by through through basically scientific grants so far. Um, but as we go on, it's like it's a hundred year project. Obviously, I'm not going to be alive until, you know, in a hundred years, but my students of which I've got, you know, a couple dozen students working on this are going to shepherd it through into the next generations. And it's really important to do this work to de demonstrate not just to study and understand, but to demonstrate to people that there are alternative ways to do things. There are other approaches um, and they work. We found that when we leave these old trees, we store carbon better. When we have a diverse community, there's way, way more sequestration. We have more biodiversity in the moss layer and more biodiversity in the lichen layer in the canopies. We have more small and large mammals using these forests, different communities. Um, and so, yeah, we're demonstrating that this works and the work is ongoing. Um, we do, um, we, we're always applying for money. It's really draining, but we're also getting um, funding from some foundations now as the word is getting out because um, people are seeing it as a really positive way um, that, that they can use, you know, they can apply this in their own forest. And, and it doesn't have to be a temperate forest in BC. It can be a temperate forest in the US or it can be even a, you know, a boreal forest or a tropical forest. These principles still apply. Um, how can you get involved? Well, you can contact me um, and get involved, or you can also just donate 
funding to the project. And there is a website called mothertreeproject.org and there's a donation button there or you can donate to UBC. Um, I would be just as happy if you donated to the Fairy Creek protesters or any kind of conservation movement that saves forests. Um, but definitely ours is very much about regenerative forestry and alternatives to clear cutting to change our pathway to show people that we have, there are better ways to do things. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. And that's awesome. And I'm really glad that we had you here this evening and that lots more people heard about your awesome work and maybe get a hang of it and will donate something or just read the book and spread your word so that, you know, especially the young people have mm -hmm. to know that, have to learn that that there is collaboration possible if you mm -hmm. want to, you yeah. know. And it gives them hope too. And it gives them agency when they actually belong to, you know, something that that works. It, yeah. it, it, it creates so much momentum to yeah. do this kind of work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can only hope that it opens the eyes of many people. I mean, we had even members which questioned, um, you know, the idea of a book about trees, what does this have to do with a mushroom club? And so I really <laughs> hope if they listened that this opened up their eyes and got rid a little bit of this tree blindness, which we all more or less have, <laughs> and get a new understanding, you know, because we are not, we didn't grow up like First Nation people, which I often wish we could, but we are not. So we have to work on it. <laughs> Anyway, I totally loved it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for all these wonderful questions. I'm sure you all have more questions. And, um, you know, I'd love to talk to any of you. So, you know, you can shoot me an email if you still have a question unanswered. But all thank right. you all. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you. Appreciate Take care, everybody. Okay. You Great. have a good night. Yeah. You too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Okay. So, just to wrap up, um, we'll cover uh, all the info um, and uh, questions about forays and show in a email newsletter coming up. Um, thank you. It looked like we had a lot of uh, folks here tonight who are either new members or just um, signing up for the, the first time or, or coming from as part of another club. So um, hopefully you'll check out our website at kitsatmushrooms.org and uh, join us again in the future. So uh, thanks everybody for all your great questions and uh, check your inboxes. Yep. Okay. Thank you and good night. Great job, Kirsten. Awesome. Good job. Good job, John. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Kirsten. We all appreciate it. All right. Good yeah. night. Okay.